And I spent a lot of time early on looking into, thinking about, <clears throat> and wondering about what sort of system solutions uh, could we come up with that would solve that problem. How do you tinker with it? How do you have more training? How do you pay people more money that are doing court-appointed work and so forth? And ultimately, continued with this idea that we could somehow objectively tinker with the system and improve it that way and improve the quality of indigent defense. I'm not saying we can't do that, but that that would somehow resolve the real issue, which is the raw material that we all have to work with. And now I'm speaking about the criminal defense bar. Because I imagine that those of you in here who are running these programs in Kennedy County probably get very, very frustrated sometimes. You want to do the right thing, but what do you really have to work with? Some really bad lawyers. That's just the truth. And uh, frankly, I, I've, I've grown very sick of the self-serving justifications advanced by the criminal defense bar that we're really all great and we really want to do good work. The truth is we're not. The truth is I think that we have come up in a system, uh, both economically and politically, that has encouraged a lot of bad work and that many people have grown very complacent with that. And my conviction got a lot deeper uh, the more that, you know, in the beginning, it just as a regular criminal defense lawyer doing paid cases uh, when I could get them. Uh, that, was, uh, that was one level of understanding. <clears throat> but it wasn't really directly in my line of sight. As I began to do post-conviction work, and began to take a look at cases like those in Tulia, for example, where, let's see, uh, my favorite one in Tulia was the, uh, the lawyer that met his client and got prepared for trial. He was a believer in quick preparation, like three minutes before the jury came in. He would never met the guy until then. Now look, you can say, well, maybe if he had been paid more money, or maybe if we'd had a better system or a better method of appointment, that wouldn't have happened. That's true, probably. But what, what's wrong with a person like that? Who could imagine, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, and this is my job, and this is how I'm going to do it? And this happens over and over and over again. Tulia really opened my eyes, because I can tell you, in every one of those cases, the level of performance and activity by the court-appointed counsel, and sometimes the paid counsel, was so far below the norm that it couldn't even be recognized. It had plummeted completely out of sight. After TUI, I founded this Innocence Project of Texas, and we've been involved, as you guys know, in a lot of exonerations in Dallas and other places. But even more to the point, what you do when you run an Innocence Project is you read jail mail. Okay? And we've gotten pretty good at it. That does not incidentally mean send me yours, if you're getting that. Okay? <laughs> Please. You get plenty of that. But you read case after case and record after record and you try to keep your students, and we now have about 80 or 90 of them all over the state working on these cases going by having them read these records and analyze these files. And just the sheer level of gross incompetence is overwhelming after a while because it's really out there. I mean lawyers that, that have never investigated a case at all that didn't meet their clients until a week before the trial or a day before the trial, if they were lucky, if the client was lucky. Uh, one of our last exonerations in Dallas, a man named James Woodard, who spent 27 years in prison for a crime that he didn't commit, met his lawyer, uh, I think, three days before his jury trial started. He gave him a list of uh, witnesses that he thought might be kind of helpful, who might be able to prove that he, in fact, wasn't there and couldn't have committed the crime. The lawyer told him he didn't have time to look at any of that, and that was a waste of time anyway because nobody was going to believe him. So James still has that little list that he kept, he kept it all those years in prison, a little tattered piece of paper that he tried to give his lawyer that day. But the question then becomes, no matter what we do, that's going to remain the raw material that we have to work with. Now, I promised you that there was some good news about this economic situation and about the changes that I think all of us are going to be dealing with in the offing. And I want to sort of advance that because I have tried to figure out how our profession became this way and why we are this way. 
I've tried to look beyond the system tinkering part to figure out what is it that took what was at one time a very noble and very uh, bold profession, a profession that prided itself on the defense of the Constitution into this kind of, uh, of sorry morass. And in order to do that, I started talking to some older lawyers. I've, I've been real fortunate because I've, uh, I've got a friend in Amarillo named Wayne who's about 94 years old and started practicing in the 1930s. And I've spent a lot of time with Wayne. And the world according to Wayne is pretty interesting because the world according to Wayne uh, is that a long time ago, before there was a lot of money clogging all of this up, lawyers simply couldn't afford to be bad at all. Not only could they not afford to be bad, but there, was, there wasn't much of a motivation for, for them to be bad. Because when nobody has anything, you get a lot less in, inclined to screw people over. That was how he put it to me. And at first I thought that was very simplistic. And then I began to think about it, and I began to realize that the world that he came up in in the 1930s as a lawyer was indeed radically different than the one we're in. It wasn't about making a lot of money. It was understood from the beginning that when you became a lawyer, you would engage in an honorable pursuit that, as Wayne told me, could enable you to live reasonably well and die with no estate. <laughs> I've made that my personal goal, incidentally. <laughs> with the creation of advertising, personal injury cases, with the kind of... Um, of models that are being presented to, I know, my students that I teach at Texas Tech, I think those sorts of ideals have been lost and were gone a long time ago. That's just not how kids coming up into the profession think anymore. But I think we're all going to be forced to start thinking like that again. Because as the money gets sucked out of the system, ironically, I think the, uh, the moral value of what we're doing uh, the chance for better character and stronger integrity is going to improve dramatically. So that's why I'm learning to love what's coming next. And that's why when I see the stock market going down, my spirits are starting to go up a little bit. And maybe I'm completely crazy like that. But I think that in general, <clears throat> because we're looking at, I think that the problem ultimately of ineffective assistance of counsel is not a legal or or system tinkering problem. It's ultimately a moral problem with the folks that are doing this kind of work. And I think that that moral problem is engendered by objective conditions, all of which are going to change, and change very dramatically very soon. So I think there's good reason to be optimistic about what we're going through and what we're going into. The other reason to be optimistic is, and I don't know if, if I suspect you guys realize this, but it really is up to you entirely, running these programs from county to county to ensure that there's real quality in the uh, delivery of criminal defense. The Court of Cri Criminal Appeals, for whatever reason, is not going to do that. In fact, when I originally got this talk together, I tried to put together a laundry list of things. It's like I would, that I was just going to throw out to you, like, for example, I mean, what would you do if you're running a county and you're, you're running an indigent defense system and a lawyer failed to file probation applications for probation-eligible clients who then went to prison because he didn't file that application. Would you keep giving the guy appointments? This is a participatory exercise. Who would continue to give that guy appointments? Nobody, right? That's like a gross failure. The client doesn't get probation. Well, according to the Court of Criminal Appeals, that's okay. That's not an effective assistance of counsel. The list goes on and on. My favorite was, <clears throat> I mean, everybody talks about the sleeping lawyer problem, right? Here's a better one. In this one, the guy let his client do the sleeping in trial. He just let the client fall asleep during his jury trial. Court of Criminal Appeals said, well, that's okay. It could have been a trial strategy. Not a good trial strategy, I wouldn't think. And the list goes on and on. <clears throat> It's up to you guys, not the Court of Criminal Appeals, through their decision-making. And I'm, there are a lot of reasons for what they've done. The law changed in 1984. Uh, it, it created a new standard for how these cases get decided. I think regardless, 
of, uh, of their reasoning or their intent behind that. The fact of the matter is it's going to be up to you guys on a county-to-county -county level and us as people involved in other branches of government, in this case, to ensure that quality, quality assistance of counsel is, uh, is delivered on a consistent basis. When you combine that with this change in the overall circumstance, because the fact of the matter is we're going to have a lot more lawyers doing this work, and I think the other fact of the matter is they're going to be competing for it harder. And I think that I'm going to predict that four or five years from now, the issues that we're dealing with now, the complaints that you hear from criminal defense lawyers about I'm not paid enough and, uh, and we don't get enough training and we're not encouraged enough, I think those are all going to be things of the past. I think that the legal profession is going to get a chance to go back to what it used to be, which was an honorable profession, a noble profession and a profession made up of people who weren't in it to get rich and become, uh, become wealthy. Anyway, so it's with those hopes in mind that I tell you guys, let's start looking forward to the economic, financial, social, and political changes that are sure to happen in the future. Let's stop being too scared about it and uh, let's just embrace it. We're in a really critical moment where we're all going to get to live through a great change in the society that we're in, due to demographics, resource depletion, whatever. We can all argue about the reasons or how important one is going to be versus another, but I, I doubt that any of us can argue with each other about whether we're in for a big change and whether, this cha and, and whether the problems that have gotten us to this spot can be easily fixed. They can't be, and it's going to be up to us to make a big difference. Uh, with that in mind, I feel, I've got to tell you, I feel a lot better after meeting some of you guys, the county administrators especially, about your, ability, uh, uh, your basic ability to make that kind of difference. And I also feel a lot better because you've been able to put up with a raspy voice caused by those uh, trees or whatever you call them down here. So anyway, thank you very much for your time.